Hi, thanks for checking this out. One time, a colleague of mine who was a really high-end professional classical orchestra wind player said to me, how come you keep playing those old silly wooden flutes? They won't even play in tune. First thing I thought was rude. But then I thought to myself, hey, if my flute sounds good in and of itself, and I can make sounds that I enjoy and sounds that I intend on the flute, in what sense is it out of tune? Sometimes I'll be at a native flute gathering or a conference of some kind, and I'll see people wandering from vendor table to vendor table looking for that perfect flute to take home with them. And sometimes there'll be somebody seated at a vendor's table and they'll have their phone open to an app that will tell them exactly what frequencies are coming out of a flute. And they'll be going from flute to flute to flute to flute and looking for that flute that will automatically produce whatever standard set of frequencies they think it ought to produce. And then sometimes I'll hear people discussing, oh, so-and-so's, that flute makers, flutes are really the best because they're closest to standard tuning or they're closest to A440. Now, this video is mostly about tuning and how it might apply to our Native American flutes. Uh, but I'm really interested in the attitudes that kind of produce those kinds of conversations. So here's another story that might help to, to unpack that a little bit. One time, some filmmakers came to me and they said, hey, we're looking to make a movie. And for the soundtrack of this movie, we need traditional sounding Native American flute music. And I said, hey, I can do that. I'll send you some stuff. Now, my family heritage is Cherokee. So for me, traditional sounding means river cane flute played in a particular way. So I did that, sent it off to them. They got back to me eventually and they said, hey, thanks for sending in this music. Sorry, we can't use it. It doesn't sound Indian enough. I thought, well, now this is really odd because here I am, Cherokee person playing a traditional river cane flute in a traditional way and you don't think it sounds Indian enough. Well, I think the translation obviously is that it didn't sound like their dominant culture stereotyped notions of what traditional Native American Indian music is supposed to sound like. And that attitude is actually underneath the earlier story I told you about my poor out of tune wooden stick flutes, right? Uh, in that case, we had a high-end classical musician uh, for whom this is what standard tuning means and anything that doesn't fit that is simply it must be a primitive, unacceptable instrument of some kind. It's just not up to standards. Right? In the other case we have, here's a stereotype notion of what your music is supposed to sound like and yours doesn't, therefore it's not acceptable. You haven't met our standard. But in both cases, that standard has nothing to do with me, has nothing to do with my people's traditional music making. It has to do with the dominant culture coming in and saying, hey, you got to do things our way, and if you don't, you're going to be shut out. Okay, stick with me because we're going to go even a little further afield because this whole discussion uh, reminds me of a time from way, way back in my student days, so long, long ago, and a wonderful exchange I heard between a harpsichord player and a classical pianist. Now, the harpsichord player was named Trevor Pinnock, and he already at that time had an international reputation as a brilliant player of harpsichord and harpsichord music and a fine conductor of early European musics of all kinds. And he had done a concert and had a follow-up workshop and was taking questions. And a classical pianist in the crowd stood up and asked the question, Mr. Pinnock, don't you ever feel frustrated playing such an inexpressive instrument. Mr. Pinnock came back with one of my favorite lines ever. He said, I don't think there is any such thing as an inexpressive instrument. There are only inexpressive players of musical instruments. That hits the nail right on the head in a lot of ways. Now, 
what's going on that this pianist would feel like that's a reasonable question to ask one of the world's great musicians playing on the instrument of his choice. Well, I think there are a couple of things, maybe. The, in, in Western thinking, time exists as a line, right? And especially if you tie it into technology, there's a sense of progress about that line, especially if you can get into some heavy manufacturing, right? Now, the piano is a newer design than the harpsichord, and it relies on manufacturing techniques. Modern pianos have enormous metal frames in them that have to be manufactured to exact tolerances. Harpsichords weren't put together that way. So piano's a newer design, it's more high-tech, therefore it must be a superior instrument. I think there's something else going on also. If this guy's a classical pianist, his favorite music in the world likely is classical piano music, and he's willing to sit in his practice room six, eight hours a day playing piano music by people like Chopin and Brahms and Liszt and so on and so forth. That's his favorite music. And a lot of it was conceived for the piano, and so of course it sounds best on the piano. But you know, like Mr. Pinnock apparently, and like me, uh, and I'm not just saying this for the video, this is the reality, I actually prefer, if I'm gonna to listen to European music, it's more likely going to be music by William Byrd or, or Johann Bach than it's going to be those other guys, right? And they wrote their keyboard music for harpsichord, and their keyboard music sounds better on harpsichord than it does on piano. So it's not really a matter of which instrument is superior to the other, it's a matter of what music do you like listening to and where does it sound best played. Now consider Mr. Pinnock and this pianist, who will remain nameless for obvious reasons, they're working in the same musical culture, what most people would call European classical music. The music they're talking about was conceived and composed within a hundred years of each other. And still they're having this argument over, oh, you're playing an unacceptable primitive instrument. My music, my instrument is so superior. Now, if that's going to happen within a culture, imagine what's going to happen between cultures, especially if one of those cultures is a very aggressive, wannabe dominant kind of culture that wants to come in and take over and sweep away an indigenous practice, one of the ways that they can do that is to discredit what's going on. Oh, look at your primitive people. You can't even make instruments that are in tune. And of course, we're going to set the standard for what in tune means. Now, the reality is that even among European classical musicians, for a long, long time, tuning systems were a regional or even a local idea. You could, they could be very greatly depending on where and when you happen to be. Nowadays, uh, at least in the US, when people say standard concert tuning, what they're talking about is a reference pitch of A440. 440 just means that the sound you're hearing is vibrating 440 waveforms per second. We call that the frequency or hertz. So A equals 440. And then the modern standard tuning system is equal temperament. That's just a set of ratios that determines the frequencies uh, of all the other pitches in the system. Equal temperament is a way of evening things out. What it really comes down to is modern pianos that are tuned standard equal temperament are out of tune all the time. They are out of tune in every key they play in, but in a way that's acceptable. It allows them to play in any key that they want to at any time. Drive strings players nuts occasionally, but that's another discussion for another time. Now, I'm gonna cut to a shot of my phone, and there's gonna be an app on it that's a, 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 a tuning app and you're going to see a dial there with the letter A on it. And I'm going to play the lowest note on this flute, which is a flute on A. So with all finger holes covered, uh, it's designed to produce a pitch reasonably close to that A. 
And what you're going to see is intentionally, I'm going to start the note a little bit under the A. Then you'll see the dial start to swing as I bring the pitch up and it's going to get to A pointing straight up and down. And then I'm going to take it a little bit further and go above A for a bit and then come back and try to keep the needle on the A as consistently as I can for just a little while. All right, here it comes. Okay, as you could see, my flute is really quite flexible in terms of pitch. I wasn't doing anything with my fingers there. That was just breath and how I was putting breath through the flute. But I could adjust the pitch really quite a lot. Certainly enough that no matter what other musicians I might be working in with in whatever tradition they are from, I can find a place and a way to make it work. Now, for some reason, today seems to be the day for guys to be with chainsaws out here pruning trees, and the chainsaws are distinctly out of tune. So if it's bleeding through at all, I apologize, but let's go on with things. Okay, so this standard tuning notion started to move throughout Europe in the later 1800s and early 1900s, and I think it's probably uh, not a surprise, not an accident even, that notions about standardized tuning should come along with a couple of other processes that are going on then. Um, remember, this is when industrialization is really taking over the economies of Europe, and that certainly begins to affect music making and musical instruments. Uh, a lot of instruments that used to be fully handmade are now starting to be made in the factory, and it's much easier to make them in the factory if they all sound alike. And we also have that great European institution, the orchestra, that is starting to grow up and kind of take on a standard shape. And that standard shape, a lot of times, might have four flutes in it, maybe even six by the time you get to the later 1800s. <clears throat> and if those flutes are all going to get along with one another, they all have to be tuned pretty much the same. And if one of those flute players has to leave and be replaced by another flute player, you need to make sure the flute they're bringing with them will fit into this big machine that's called the orchestra uh, without wrecking things too much. Now that really kind of circumscribes the opportunities for individual expression, but it gives you this enormous music making machine called the orchestra that can, can do some really cool things from time to time. Now, the other thing, of course, that's going on in this time frame is um, the, the European powers and their Euro-American descendants are kind of globetrotting, uh, setting up their colonies and basically trying to either dominate or in many cases displace the indigenous cultures that they're finding. And one way you can dominate and or displace is to discredit those cultures. And certainly one way that you can discredit those cultures is to discredit the music they're making because a lot of times the music making has very important ceremonial purpose. So if you can come in and say, oh look, uh, you're playing drums, drums are a primitive instrument, you gotta stop playing those drums uh, and learn how to sing proper hymns, for example, or look at those silly wooden flutes you have, they won't even play in tune. You have to learn how to play in tune if you want to be a properly civilized person. Right? So the, the, the level of cultural arrogance involved with this is breathtaking, uh, and it's being done to a purpose, to dominate, discredit, displace. Okay. Enough about European and Euro-American standard tuning for now. Let's talk about some native flutes. This is a, a Cherokee-style river cane flute. One way we had of scaling out a flute back in the day, I'm going to have to back up here a little bit so you can see this, is that uh, the flute can be about as long as your arm. Right? The distance between the cutting edge, business end where the sound is produced, 
and the top finger hole can be about the width of your hand. The distance between each of the finger holes about the width of your thumb. Same thing with the bore of the flute. And then if you're a good flute maker, you know where to cut the end off so that it sounds pretty. Okay, so there's a standardization there, but it's about how the flute is made and most importantly, the relationship between the flute and the person who's playing the flute. The standardization is not that all of the flutes have to sound the same when you get done. In fact, if I have a flute to my specs and whoever's watching, if you have a flute to your body specs, it's almost certain that our flutes will sound a little bit different. They probably won't play the same bottom note. The scales might sound a little bit different. We'll have different outside notes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but our flute will be in right relationship with us. It will have something to do with the person that's carrying it. Now, this particular river cane flute was made for me by my tribal brother, Jim Gilliland. And um, Jim is a retired NASA engineer. He likes to tweak things and fiddle with things a bit. And so he's tweaked the traditional tuning of this so that it will fit in more easily with uh, other modern instruments. And I think, generally speaking, that's a really, really good thing, right? I, I, I like playing with uh, musicians from other traditions. I especially like playing uh, with people like Leonard Stevens. Uh, if you know my album, Many Roads Home, Lenny is the guitar player on that album and produced the album. A really, really wonderful, wonderful musician. And he has spent a lot of time thinking about and studying microtones. Now, microtones are notes that are so close together that they would fit between the keys of a piano. I mean, really, really small intervals here. So he hears them really well and he knows how to make music with them. And sometimes we'll be playing and I might do something like this. And he'll go, oh, what was that note? And how can I find it on my guitar? So I really love working with musicians like Lenny because his ears are wide open and he's really open to what my instrument can do. I'm really open to what his instrument can do. And when, when you have musicians like that working together, you can find some really cool new ways of doing things. Now, I also have uh, played with orchestras quite a lot, classical orchestras quite a lot, and I enjoy playing with them too. And certainly some of the the tweaked modern tunings on our flute help me to accommodate what they want to be able to do so that, you know, if I need to be close to A440, I can usually get there. But uh, I also really, really like intentionally throwing notes to them that sometimes will make their ears twitch a little bit. Uh, because I do like reminding them that, yes, we can make beautiful music together. We can be in good musical dialogue together without me having to fully assimilate to your notions of standardized tuning. You still need to take my flute for what it is. Because here's the reality for me. For my ears, standard A440 equal temperament tuning and fast food hamburgers have some of the same problems. They've both been measured and standardized to the point that they really don't have any flavor left. There are still flute makers out there who do things the old way. And I love finding flutes that are made that way because I know they will have a unique voice, a unique personality, and will do things that none of my other flutes will do. And even my flutes that are in a more modern kind of adapted tuning will play plenty of notes that you won't find in the standard tuning system. And I love that about them. So are my flutes tuned to A440? Thankfully, no. But they still can make beautiful music, even with instruments that are tuned that way. Now, I actually think there's some more inter interesting questions to ask than just, is my flute tuned to A440? Here's one of them. Is my flute in tune with itself? Does it have a beautiful voice? Does it have a flexible voice? Do all of the notes that it plays sound well together, like they belong together? Was the flute maker a conscientious artisan? 
did they bring the right spirit to their flute making. Then, am I in tune with my flute? Have I spent enough time with this flute to know where its notes lie and how they relate to one another? Do I know what kinds of things it does well and which kinds of things it maybe doesn't like to do? Can I pull it out of the bag at just the right time when it will fit in beautifully with what's going on around it? Then also, am I in tune with the beauty that's around me all the time? Instead of trying to force myself onto what's going on, can I be connected and open and listening and trying to be in beautiful dialogue with what's going on around me? Can I choose the right flute at the right time? For me, playing in tune is really pretty deep work. And I think we lose a lot when we reduce being in tune to some kind of superficial matching of numbers on a dial, especially when those numbers were put there by self-appointed authorities who historically have been much more interested in forced assimilation than they have been in open musical dialogue. To end up today, if you'd like to hear some of the things that I've been talking about in action, uh, here are some recordings you can look for. I'm going to start with a couple of native flute recordings from the 1980s, and I think of these as kind of necessary, classic native flute recordings. The first is by Kevin Locke, the great Lakota flute player. It's called Love Songs of the Lakota. And on this disc, uh, Mr. Locke plays flutes that were made by Richard Fulbull and by Dan Red Buffalo, who were both great, great traditional Lakota flute makers. So there are three flutes on this recording, and each one of them has a very distinctive voice, a very distinctive personality, and a very distinctive tuning. And of course, Kevin plays all of them beautifully. Uh, the second is R.C. Nakai's Canyon Trilogy. Um, most of R.C.'s flutes are made by Ken Light. Ken Light models his flutes after 19th century plain style flutes. So each of his flutes tends to have a very, very distinctive personality and tuning as well. Uh, even better, R.C. on this recording plays uh, some tracks on Eagle Bone Whistle. And of course, that's completely its own beast with its own scale and own voice. And nobody plays Eagle Bone Whistle as beautifully as R.C. for my ears. This entire disc is profoundly in tune. Earlier on, I mentioned the great English harpsichordist and conductor, Trevor Pinnock. There are dozens of recordings by Mr. Pinnock on the market. My personal favorites are uh, a two-disc set of Bach sonatas for violin and harpsichord obligato that he did with the wonderful uh, Baroque violinist Rachel Podger. Uh, for, again, for my ears, I don't think there's anybody better than Rachel Podger for Bach. Now, if you want to talk bluegrass fiddling or something, we need to talk about other people. But, but uh, both of these are really, really great players. And they're using a tuning system that would have been familiar to Bach. So A is not 440 on this recording. It's A. 415. can also recommend uh, Mr. Pinnock's uh, recording of Haydn symphonies. And for this, again, they're using uh, historical instruments, historical tuning systems, etc. And in this case, A is set to 421, not A440. And you're seeing a pattern, right? There's a gradual drift for A to get higher and higher in the European, European tuning systems over time. Uh, to where now in the States, A is usually set at 440, significantly higher than what Bach or Haydn would have known. And then finally, uh, I'll go out on a limb here and recommend one of my own. This is a recording called Red Moon, and I did this recording with the wonderful Larkia 
uh, Aboriginal musician Ash Dargon and uh, Mohawk musician Don Avery. So you'll be hearing a lot of didgeridoo, a lot of different Native American flutes and bird calls and whistles, a lot of cello. Don Avery's a wonderful cellist. We all contributed songwriting ideas. But what's most um, interesting for our purposes on this video uh, is Ash Dargon's vocals. I have a real distinct memory in one of the studio sessions of Ash laying down some layered vocals. And at the end of it, the engineer, in a well-meaning attempt to be helpful, said, hey, if you want to, I can put some auto-tuner on that. Now, auto-tuner is a, is a device that pulls pitches in one direction or another, and, and generally what it wants to do is pull them towards standard equal-tempered tuning. It's become a plague on pop music recordings because Let's be honest, maybe not all of those pop singers got their contracts because they're good at hitting pitches. But Ash said to the guy, do not touch the auto-tuner. I am singing exactly what I intend to sing. And Ash is a wonderful singer, and again, his singing here is deeply in tune. All right, I think all of these uh, recommendations are available in full on YouTube or YouTube Music, except for the Kevin Locke. I haven't been able to find that uh, CD, maybe out of print, I don't know. You may have to look for a used copy someplace like India House or uh, see if you can find it streaming someplace else online. Okay, I think that's about it for today. If you found this uh, useful, uh, please hit those like and subscribe buttons. If you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and I'll have a lot of uh, good information and other links in the description box as well. All right, I'll see you down the road. Stay in tune.